The APA Section 7062A Arbitrary or Capricious Standard can seem amorphous. The court in Overton Park was not in a position to apply it, so we have to look to other cases. Judge Harold Leventhal of the D.C. Circuit Court of Appeal explained that the court's role is to determine whether the agency has taken a hard look at facts and policy before taking action. Over time, this came to be understood as a matter of the reviewing courts itself taking a hard look at whether the agency took a hard look. As Judge Leventhal explained it, hard look review meant excluding certain explanations of why the agency acted. Impermissible whim, improper influence, misplaced zeal, unconscious preference, irrelevant prejudice. The core idea is to assure reasoned decision-making by the agency. The Supreme Court is said to have adopted the hard look approach in its decision in the so-called airbags case, Motor Vehicle Manufacturers Association versus State Farm Mutual Insurance. The governing statute directed the Secretary of Transportation to promulgate motor vehicle safety regulations that shall be practicable, shall meet the need for motor vehicle safety, and shall be stated in objective terms. With this authority, the Transportation Secretary promulgated Regulation 208, which was modified several times over the years. In 1967, Seat belts were required for the first time, but it then became apparent that the majority of drivers and passengers never bother to buckle up for safety. The Secretary, therefore, in 1972, published a notice of a proposed rule to require so-called passive protection by 1975. There was vocal opposition from liberty-loving Americans, and in 1974, Congress enacted a law forbidding the Secretary to require use-compelling features like ignition locks and buzzers. In 1977, the Secretary promulgated a modified Standard 208, which required manufacturers to install either airbags or automatic seat belts by the year 1984. The rule was upheld by against legal challenges. In 1980, Ronald Reagan was elected president the fact that some of the concurring justices in the airbags case thought the court gave little, too little weight to. And in 1981, the Secretary of Transportation appointed by President Reagan rescinded modified Standard 208 entirely. Neither airbags nor automatic seat belts would be required, only the lap belts that had been required since 1967. This is the agency action that is the focus of the airbags case. The issue in the case is whether the rescission of modified standard 208 was arbitrary or capricious. The contemporaneous explanation provided by the Secretary focused not on the technology, but on what use Detroit proposed to make of it. The 1977 modified standard 208 was adopted on the basis of a projection that 60% of new cars in the 1984 model year would ship with airbags. But by 1981, it was evident to the agency that Detroit was only going to put airbags in 1% of its 1984 fleet. The remaining 99% would be delivered with automatic seat belts. The secretary explained further that without use compelling features, users would detach automatic seat belts and defeat the purpose of installing them. Safety itself could get a bad name. And as for simply requiring airbags, well, airbags were untried and scary. Besides, the Supreme Court decided that this was not the reasoned explanation that required. It held the rescission of modified Standard 208 to have been arbitrary and capricious in failing to give an airbags only option any serious thought. Separately, the court held that the agency had been arbitrary or capricious in ignoring the inertia factor 
and projecting that automatic seat belts would not realize sufficient improvement in safety to justify the cost. If people are too lazy and careless to buckle up, what, why assume that they are suddenly energetic and deliberate when it comes to unbuckling? Along that line, the court also faulted the agency for failing to consider continuous non-detachable belts. The agency explained that the public was gripped by an irrational fear of being trapped by an automatic seat belt. A continuous seat belt, though, had tested to be as easy to detach in an emergency as an ordinary manual lap belt. And besides, in addition to a continuously spooling type of automatic seat belt, the agency had failed to consider it requiring that cars come equipped with life hammers. An inexpensive device that is good not only for cutting through tough seat belt webbing, but also for smashing windows to get out if the doors are jammed shut as your car is sinking in floodwaters. Just kidding. The agency does not have to consider every far-fetched option. But according to the court, an agency rule would be arbitrary and capricious if the agency has relied on factors which Congress has not intended it to consider. Entirely fail to consider an important aspect of the problem. Often an explanation for its decision that runs counter to the evidence or is so implausible that it could not be the product of agency expertise. And in general, the agency must explain the evidence, which is available, and must offer a rational connection between the facts found and the choice made. The court refined this approach in the later case of Fox Television versus FCC. This case is a challenge to a change in the FCC's no indecent language rule. During hours when young children are likely to be watching, the FCC thought the public interest would be served by a rule requiring broadcasters and performers to watch their language. The 1987 version of the rule distinguished between literal and non-literal uses of what comedian George Carlin called the seven dirty words. These words relate to excretory functions and sexual performances, however they are used, but sometimes they are not meant to represent these literally. The FCC determined that excited offhand figurative use was relatively harmless unless that use was deliberate and repetitive. By contrast, any literal use meant to describe the very act of letter, 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 lettering, was intolerable and subject to fine or worse. In 2004, the FCC announced it was changing the rule. The rule, as amended, made no allowance for non-literal use of indecent language. The FCC's main reason was that over the years since the rule first came into effect, bleeping technology had improved so much that it was not too burdensome to require broadcasters to bleep out all indecent language, and not merely the literal and deliberate or repetitive non-literal indecency. Makes bleeping sense, wouldn't you say? The court decided that amending the rule to take advantage of newer technology wasn't an arbitrary or capricious action. The challengers argued that the modification had to be an improvement over the prior rule if it was to be anything other than misplaced zeal. The court demurred. Not just anything goes, the court wrote. A reasoned explanation would ordinarily demand that the agency display awareness that it is changing position. The agency must show that there are good reasons for the new policy but it need not demonstrate that the reasons for the new policy are better. Unless new policy rests upon factual findings that contradict those which underlay its prior policy, or when its prior policy has engendered serious reliance interests. A reasoned explanation is needed for disregarding facts that underlay or were engendered by the prior policy. But these circumstances were not presented. 
The only new fact was that the bleeping technology and what bleeping reliance interest could the broadcasters complain was disappointed. Their bleeping reliance in being able to let share bleep or bleeping bleeps in front of the kids gathered in America's living rooms? No bleeping way!